Hey everybody, welcome to CAF World War II, the show where we talk about World War II, aviation, history, and so much more. World War II is produced by the Commemorative Air Force, the world's largest flying museum. Our mission is to educate, inspire, and honor through flight and living history experiences. The CAF began the Warbird movement more than 65 years ago. And thanks to the support of individuals like you, we continue to grow strong. We hope you enjoyed this episode. And now our host, Steve Buss. Thanks for watching and keep them flying. Good evening and welcome everyone. This is episode number 113 of Warbird Tube. And tonight we're going to dig into a fascinating story from the early war years centering around Pan Am Airlines. Now, before we get started, please do us a favor. If you haven't already done so, please take a second to like, share, or subscribe, and follow us. Now, if you do subscribe on YouTube, click that little bell icon, and you'll get notifications about new episodes of Warbird Tube when we go live. Now, as you're watching tonight, you may have some questions. Just type those in the comment section. We'll try to answer them uh, before we sign off tonight. Now, joining me is Tom Culbert, who uh, co-wrote a book called Pan-African, the uh, Across the Sahara in 1941 with Pan Am. And Tom... Great to have you on the show tonight. Well, thank you, Steve. It's good to be here. Appreciate it. Good. Well, uh, tell us a little bit about your background uh, before we get into the book. Oh, yeah. Well, first of all, uh, uh, thank you for the invite to, uh, to to talk about this subject. It gives me the opportunity to express uh, my thoughts on two of my most favorite topics, and, and that is uh, Africa and also uh, aviation. And uh, we combine them here in this book called Pan-Africa. Um, I was an Air Force pilot, and uh, I became one of a very few Air Force officers that were tra we, we were trained as Africanists. And by that, uh, the Air Force sent me to school and then sent me to Africa, where I lived and worked at American embassies in Africa as an Air Force attache uh, for over five years. So I was based out of Cairo, Egypt, and then also out of West Africa in Abidjan, Cote d'Ivoire or Ivory Coast. And uh, while doing that, I had an airplane. The Air Force uh, provided me with a uh, C-12, and it was mainly for embassy support uh, across Africa. I, uh, I had the opportunity to land at some pretty interesting airstrips out in the, the, uh, the Sahara Desert and the Sahel in, in West Af in Africa. And uh, I kept asking the question, uh, why was this airfield here? And I got different, different answers depending on who I was talking to. But uh, make a long story medium, it uh, turns out that these airfields were used in the early days of World War II uh, by a commercial carrier, Pan American Airways, and uh, they were supporting the British RAF effort in North Africa to begin with. And then, as you'll hear in the in the uh, gist of this presentation, uh, there was mission creep, and the Pan Am folks ended up doing a lot more to help the Allies in World War II. My interest was 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 based on that. I retired from the Air Force, and I met up with the uh, the 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 Alumni Association for this particular effort. So, fifteen hundred American citizens uh, were involved, and. Uh, they wanted their story told, and I said, well, I'll tell the story if I'll write the book, if you guys provide the information, and uh, what you're going to see is, is, is basically information that they provided, and it's the uh, true story, little known uh, true story of Pan American Airways Africa Limited, it was a subsidiary of Pan Am in 1941 and 1942. It's a it's an amazing story, and like you said, very very not well known at all. But when you when you read the book, and then you, you pull back in 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 time and, and look at where the world was in uh, you know 1940 1941, um, Pan Am was perfectly positioned to be able to pull off the mission that that needed, and that was uh, a lot of support, uh, especially in the in the Middle East and and Africa, and that's sort of how this all all gets started. So Tom, take it away. All right. Well, as I mentioned, uh, two of my most favorite topics, uh, uh, Africa and aviation. But basically, um, uh, in 1941, I think it's kind of interesting. We, sh we should just stop and, and take, a, take a look. You know, what was going on in the world in 1941? And, of course, Europe was at war. 
Um, the United States uh, was a non-combatant, a neutral country at the time. We were, we, we were restricted in what we could do. But of course, uh, people like uh, the president of the United States, FDR, uh, was very supportive of the British war effort and, uh, and really wanted to, to, to enhance uh, the British efforts. And, um, and since Britain, the Great, Brit Great Britain was in such uh, dire straits, uh, FDR was kind of leaning forward and trying to do whatever he could to support uh, the British uh, war effort. So, of course, in, in early 1941, uh, FDR met up with Winston Churchill, and um, the, the British were in dire straits. Um, in, in Europe, uh, Dunkirk, uh, France had fallen. Um, the, uh, the Suez Canal was critical to the British efforts to uh, resupply uh, their forces in the uh, Malaysia and, uh, and Burma. So, uh, so they did meet um, off the coast of Maine in early 1941, and uh, they were able to discuss what kind of assistance would be needed. And also now in, in June of 1941, uh, the president of Pan American Airways, Juan Tripp, was invited to London to give a talk at the Royal Aeronautic Society's uh, Wright Memorial Dinner. At that dinner, he gave his talk about long-range navigation, long-range aviation, uh, because, of course, Pan Am had the experience in the Pacific. And um, there were really no other um, actors around that had the experience that Pan American Airways had in long-range navigation and logistical support for an airline operation over extreme distances. So uh, Juan Tripp gave his talk, had dinner, and, uh, and the story goes that uh, shortly thereafter, he was summoned to uh, 10 Downey Street where he met Winston Churchill. And again, they talked about long-range navigation and how could, some, uh, how could an, an entity like Pan Am assist the British in their efforts to move airplanes and support into North Africa where Rommel was threatening the Suez Canal. And uh, by the time Juan Tripp got back to Washington, uh, meetings were arranged with U.S. defense uh, uh, personnel. And uh, by August of 1941, contracts were being signed to, uh, to enable Pan American Airways to provide men and equipment into Africa to support the RAF war effort in North Africa. So the question comes up, well, how does the United States provide assistance to Europe and to Africa um, because of the great distances? And you see here, there's three different uh, proposed routes. One is a Northern route, which was okay, except that the weather was, was really prohibitive and, and uh, it was not something that could be relied upon 12 months of the year. The, uh, the middle route across the mid-Atlantic, uh, again, was just really too long. And it ended up in Portugal, which was kind of a questionable location at that time also. Um, just really not, not a very good operating uh, base out of, out of Europe at that time. So they looked to the south, and the decision was made to provide men and equipment using the South Atlantic route. And by that, that means flying down the coast of, of Florida, hopping into Eastern Brazil, and then using uh, long range aircraft. And that at that point in time, it was the, the uh, Boeing 314 to fly across the South Atlantic to the west hump of, of Africa. And that, uh, that was decided and the contracts were signed and by September of 1941, Pan Am had men and equipment moving to West Africa. Now, when we say equipment, we mean just about everything that is necessary to operate an airline across Central Africa. So much of the equipment had to go by ship. Um, 
we're talking about weather navigate weather information weather uh, equipment we're talking about commissary food building supplies um, construction equipment uh, caterpillars um, you name it they had to transport all of that across the globe to enter into West Africa now you ask why West Africa well what the British were doing they would use ships to transport crated aircraft from the UK to their colonies in West Africa. So the, the ships would dock outside the coastline of, of Ghana, modern day Ghana. At that time, it was the Gold Coast. And then the airplanes would be brought to shore in crates, reassembled, and tried, and the British would try to fly them across Central Africa all the way to Cairo. And, uh, and they just really weren't able to do that uh, successfully. And so that's why Pan Am jumped in, provided pilots, airplanes, equipment, fuel, water, you name it. Um, they had to build this route across Central Africa. Now this is a, uh, a map of what Pan American Airways Africa Limited did in 1941 and 42. And uh, it gets a little busy on the left-hand side there, but you see, you do see Accra. And Accra is in the Gold Coast or, or modern day uh, Ghana. And that was the main operating base set up by Pan American Airways Africa Limited. And you'll see across Central Africa, all the uh, different stops all the different routes, obviously, all the different uh, airports that were being used to transport airplanes. Now, what kind of airplanes are we talking about? We're talking about Blenheim bombers. We're talking about hurricanes and eventually P-40s that came across uh, from the United States and would hop across Central Africa. And the reason there are so many airfields is that of course all these aircraft had limited range and getting fuel out to these remote sites was extremely difficult. And so airplanes had to hop across Central Africa and you see Khartoum, Khartoum was a major operating location there. And then from Khartoum, the airplanes would, would be flying up north to Cairo and where they would be used in the Western desert, west of Cairo to try to protect the city of Cairo and the Suez Canal. As I mentioned, um, they used the Boeing 314s and here's the, uh, the Cape Town Clipper. As it was ready to launch in LaGuardia Marine Terminal in New York City on 27 September 1941. And this was the first departure <clears throat> from the US going all the way to Africa. Uh, it's kind of uh, Amazing to think that uh, Juan Tripp had his June dinner in London and contracts were signed in August and people and equipment were moving in September. A, uh, an incredible feat by an airline operation and uh, it would be pretty hard pressed to, uh, to meet that today. So we see here another 314 being refueled. And what they did is they used the 314 to land in the lagoon system in West Africa. And you can actually see in the far, out, in the far side there that there's a, uh, there's a barrier uh, of land. This aircraft is on, on a lagoon inside Liberia, West Africa. And uh, there's some interesting stories are told about how the, uh, the, these, these locations were initially lo were found by, the, uh, by Pan Am. And uh, one of the uh, stories go that the, uh, the first Boeing 314 was looking for a place to land in this lagoon system. And they, they preferred to land somewhere near the city of, of Monrovia, Liberia. And there was a lagoon there. So they came in, they did a couple of low passes and, and it looked pretty good. And, and they were about ready to come around for a landing on the lagoon near, near Monrovia. And there was a, a fisherman and a, and a pirogue uh, uh, on the on the uh, lagoon. And as the uh, airplane started coming down, the fisherman jumped out of his canoe and and walked to shore. And um, 
according to the uh, the crew at the time, they figured that uh, it was a little bit too shallow for their aircraft, and they had to find somewhere else to land. Well, that's why they ended up in, in a place called Fisherman's Lake, Liberia, which is, is west of the main city of, of Monrovia. An interesting thing here to see is you see the, uh, the American flag uh, painted on the fuselage. That flag was also painted on the top of the wings. And here's another, uh, another example of the, the flag and the, the front end of a 314. Uh, American shipping and aviation uh, craft all had those flags print, painted on them in 1941 because the U.S. was a non-combatant, and uh, so that was the uh, basically the IFF identification friend or foe uh, a symbol that was used in 1941 to indicate that this was not a combatant aircraft and therefore it should not be fired upon. Uh, this particular photo shows a 314 uh, on the Nile River outside of Khartoum. And uh, you'll see in the, in the background that there are some additional British uh, flying boats on, on the river. But uh, this is always, th this particular photograph uh, that the Alumni Association provided uh, really intrigues me because you see the fellow out there on engine number one probably checking the, the oil level or whatever. And it just, uh, it really irks me to know that somebody climbed all the way up on the wing of this 314 and took only one photograph. Um, I would have loved to have seen uh, many more photographs of this particular operation on the Nile River in 1941. So I mentioned uh, not everything went by air, of course. So here is uh, some of the, the Pan Am fellows uh, en route to West Africa on board a, uh, a freighter. And there were numerous freighters used to transport all the equipment, all the supplies that were needed to operate across Central Africa. This is the, uh, after it was established, this is the actual um, operating base, main operating base in Accra, Gold Coast, or Ghana. And um, you'll see that, uh, you know, the, the plywood, the, the mosquito netting, the uniforms, uh, all of that had to be shipped across the ocean over to West Africa. You notice on the, um, on the lower left side here, this is a, uh, air, an air raid shelter that was built. And uh, the fellows uh, tell some interesting stories about, uh, about their lives and, and, and their, their daily operations in, uh, in West Africa. But they built these, uh, these air raid shelters. And from time to time, they would have an air raid drill and the men were supposed to report inside these bunkers. And they, the, uh, the fellows mentioned that they did that a couple of times under test, but in, after that, they, uh, they basically did, did not want to go down into the cellars because um, if you're familiar with West Africa, if there's a cool, damp place, there are a lot of different critters that love to... Uh, love to inhabit those places. So you've got scorpions and you've got all kinds of snakes and things like that uh, inside those things. So the men, uh, the men decided not to, uh, not to partake of that very often. Luckily, uh, this part of the route was never, uh, never uh, uh, saw hostile action by the, uh, by the Axis powers. Uh, one of the locations, uh, N'Djamena Chad, uh, did actually have a bombing at one time. Uh, a German, a German bomber came down from North Africa and dropped a few bombs uh, on that particular location. But uh, other than that, uh, the route basically uh, across Africa was fairly secure. Again, uh, this is a, a typical airfield operation uh, as, the, uh, as, the, as the war was ginning up. You see the different types of aircraft uh, construction, again, taking place on, the, on an airfield in West Africa. Here you see uh, some, of the, uh, some of the different types of aircraft that, that would be found uh, on the airfields. Um, I often ask the question, uh, does anybody know what this British aircraft is in the, on the right-hand side there? And uh, I, uh, I found out myself that it is a Martin 187 Baltimore and uh, this was one of the aircraft that, uh, that the British had actually purchased in the late 30s. Uh, 
from the United States. But uh, that is a Martin 187 Baltimore. So as the war progressed, uh, the, uh, the ability to have aircraft and maintain aircraft got really serious. Uh, I found this particular photo in the National Archives in Washington, D.C., but it shows uh, kind of a maintenance uh, nightmare of uh, people working on these different airplanes, uh, um, Commonwealth airplanes, uh, but you do see down at the bottom uh, there is an American aircraft being worked on also. So a uh, tremendous uh, number of aircraft were being moved across Africa, and, uh, and this is what... Uh, uh, a, a typical maintenance operation would look like. So, as you can tell, they were pretty isolated uh, sitting out there in West Africa. And now, December 7th, 1941, the U.S. is at war. And in Africa, you have a large number of American civilians operating to all effect a, uh, an airline resupply logistic operation uh, for the combatant forces. Um, so that was always an issue um, about using civilians in a war zone to, uh, to conduct this type of operation. The, uh, the route now uh, expands, and as you'll see a little bit later, uh, mission creep uh, occurs. And uh, what happens is that uh, the, the, this particular air route now becomes the most significant air route in the world in 1941 and 1942, because there was no other way to transport individuals and equipment in such long distances around the, around the world. As again, the North Atlantic was not available because of the winter months. The Pacific was questionable because of the Japanese. And all of a sudden, the Central Africa route um, is extremely significant. And you can see the different types of passengers that were being used, uh, or were using this particular route. Uh, here you've got air crew members, uh, military folks, uh, you've got uh, people in, in suits or probably diplomats of some sort, uh, again, uh, became extremely significant that this route was operating and allowed the Allies movement across, the, uh, across Africa and to the war zones. Here's another photograph uh, showing uh, a Pan Am airplane in the background, and, and these were all passengers waiting to get on the flight uh, somewhere in Africa in September of 1942. Tom, when you, when you look at that picture, I, I, I was amazed by the fact that, that it looks like the, uh, the ticket desk is just a, a <laughs> folding table and, and a chair sitting out in the middle of a field somewhere. It's really... Uh, <laughs> It's really quite primitive, but I. But your point being is just that that mix of of passengers that were moving from west to east, uh, and and people needed to get there, and and uh, yeah. Pan Am was was taking care of them. Yeah, yeah. There, there, again, there was no other way yeah. to move people around the globe, and, and and that that route was was it. I mean, that, that was it. Yeah. Europe was Europe was was shut down. Now. So other than just military folks, uh, you also have dignitaries. Now, um, here is a picture of Wendell Wilkie. And uh, Wendell Wilkie was a Republican uh, run, uh, candidate for president, lost to FDR. But both Wendell Wilkie and FDR were very supportive of the British war effort. And in fact, uh, FDR allowed or, or signed uh, Wilkie up for an around the world visit to our allies uh, around the world, uh, our allies in Russia, um, uh, in China. And he gave Wendell Wilkie an airplane. And uh, this is the Gulliver. And that's an Army Air Corps crew that, that took Wendell Wilkie around the world. Now, I was talking about Pan Am being able and being flexible and, and, uh, being the uh, the American uh, uh, in, having the ingenuity and the Yankee attitude, so Wendell, FDR asked Wendell Wilkie to go to um, Turkey after he lands in Cairo, and uh, the Turks were neutral at the time, so they were not going to allow Wendell Wilkie to fly into Turkey 
in this airplane that looks like a B-24. This is actually a, 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 a non-combat version of the B-24. But uh, they would not allow him to come in. So the American embassy in Cairo uh, turned to Pan Am and they said, uh, you know, is there anything you can do to help us get Wendell Wilkie to, Car to, uh, to Turkey? And um, in fact, what they did is Pan Am offered a, a, a C-47 that was military drab camouflage. And overnight, they painted it to look like a commercial airplane. And uh, what they did is they made it into a, a commercial airplane. They put wicker seats uh, in, in, the, uh, in the fuselage for the passengers to sit at and a Pan Am crew flew Wendell Wilkie into Turkey. And I was at the National Archives again, and uh, on 7 October 1942, this is a photo of that DC-3 landing in Turkey. And uh, in the foreground there, you see B-24s. Uh, these were part of the raid on the Poeste Romanian oil fields that had to divert into Turkey, and then the, the crews were in turn in Turkey. And so one of Wendell Wilkie's tasks was to try to get these guys uh, freed uh, while, he was in, uh, while he was in Turkey. But uh, this, is, uh, this is what that airplane looked like when it was on the ground. And you'll see they painted this white stripe across the, the fuselage. It says Pan American Airways System. And uh, the, actually, the, uh, the RAF in Cairo helped Pan Am paint the airplane so that it looked like a civilian airplane. The, uh, the Pan Am chief of, of, of the uh, operation in Cairo wrote a, an after-action report saying that the, uh, the RAF did a great job, but the, uh, the round uh, Pan Am globe on, on the nose, and you don't see it in this picture, he said that it's, it's, it's the uh, Western Hemisphere, so you've got North America and South America. And uh, the, uh, the, the quote was that they did a pretty good job painting, although South America looked an awful lot like Australia. And uh, so it was the, uh, the British influence, uh, the Australian influence, as they, uh, as they uh, got this airplane ready for Wendell mm -hmm. Wilkie. Now, flying in Africa, mm -hmm. And um, I, I mentioned I had flown in Africa, and it's it's really quite a quite an experience. Um, back in when I was there, and of course when when these guys were there back in the 40s, I I flew out of the embassies in in, in the 1970s and 80s. But again, uh, no nav aids, so a lot of uh, a lot of direct reckoning. And when I flew into Cairo, I took a a C12 in for the very first time, uh, a Beach Super King Air. And I went to the Egyptian Air Force, and I asked, uh, what do I need to know about flying in North Africa? And uh, one of the uh, Egyptian uh, pilots, um, uh, one of the general officers came up to me and he said, you know, Tom, what you need to do, when you're flying in North Africa, you have to fly like you're flying over the ocean. And he said, you know, you, you'll have no nav aids, you'll have no weather, and you'll have very little ground uh, references to navigate with. And, uh, and now that I think back on that, it's, it's, really, it's really intriguing because um, who else but Pan American could have done something like flying in Africa in 1941 because they had all this experience of flying over water. And uh, so uh, uh, direct reckoning is a... Uh, uh, a, a, a modern a modern method of navigation that uh, that works to this day. So very few uh, very few physical landmarks uh, that you could navigate with. One of the uh, here's here's one on a on a clear day. But normally what you end up with is a lot of sand, blowing sand in the, in the air, and um, what you find is that uh, visibility. Is, is extremely limited. And if you look, in, if you're in, in sand at, at, you know, 15, 20,000 feet, um, you can look straight down and see the ground, but you can't look out at a 45 degree angle because the, the light refracts off of the sand and it's basically zero, zero. Uh, 
So um, it makes for some very interesting navigation and, uh, and flying experiences in Africa without nav aids, no such thing as GPS and, and, uh, and all of that. So the, uh, the operation was to transport aircraft across Africa so that the British could, could, could uh, use them in the war against uh, Rommel. And here's an example of a P-40 that got lost and ran out of fuel and uh, and landed in the uh, in the Sahel, and the standard operating procedure at that time was to land the aircraft, dead stick, gear up, and wait to be picked up by a Pan Am crew coming out in a DC three. And what they would do then is they would jack up the aircraft, lower the landing gear, change the prop, change the oil. Uh, give the uh, the pilot some more gas and then point them in the right direction so he could get to the next airfield and uh, and refuel. Refueling was always a bit major issue, and you can imagine how long it takes to uh, refuel a, a B-24 out of 55-gallon drums. Now, a little bit later, things got a little more modern, and they actually have a Bowser there to help refuel this aircraft. But again, not all landings and takeoffs were successful. Uh, here you have a, a, a DC-3 that ran into some problems and uh, ended up in a ditch and uh, needed some a lot of manpower to pull that out. Now, of course, uh, we're talking about Americans operating in very austere conditions and locations. Um, so, of course, having mascots uh, are always are always a thing, and uh, all these different these different uh, locations along the route. Many of them had uh, had monkeys. They had giraffes, and uh, one of them even had a lion. And so this was this was Leo the lion, and they had gotten this lion as a gift when it was just a small little cub. And uh, lion cubs are really cute and 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 nice, but uh, so the, this is at El Fasher. In, the, in western Darfur, Sudan. And uh, the, the story goes that the, uh, they would have Leo the lion in the, uh, in the operations little, little hut. And in fact, when a, a new co-pilot would come in to land, the, uh, the crews would, would tell the co-pilot that they were going to take care of the paperwork on the airplane and send the co-pilot in to, uh, to check in. Well, as he was walking across the ramp, Leo would go after him. And as lions normally do, they, they knock the feet out from their prey. And, and Leo would, would, would knock the uh, co-pilot's legs out. And as the co-pilot was laying on the ground, Leo would jump on him and lick him. And uh, the storyline goes that uh, everybody got a lot of big laughs out of that, but there was also a lot of dirty laundry that uh, that came out of uh, those episodes. And so eventually, over the months, uh, Leo got bigger and bigger and bigger. And as you see here, he's getting, this is a, a good shot of a good sized lion. And uh, so they eventually ended up taking him to the, uh, to the zoo in Khartoum. And uh, one, day, one weekend, uh, some of the guys had a, some time off and they went to Khartoum and uh, and they saw Leo the lion in the lion pen, and so they they climbed over the fence and uh, and went in and and got to pet Leo. And needless to say, uh, other folks that were in the area were quite uh, quite uh, taken by the fact that these guys had jumped into the lion den and uh, and uh, created quite a stir in the Khartoum Zoo. So as the war progresses now. Um, this is uh, this is General Brereton in Cairo, and uh, he uh, he was in charge of the uh, of the air, of the air air forces U.S. U.S. air forces in the Middle East, and uh, as I mentioned, uh, mission creep. Now, in April of 1942, there was a uh, a serious call for assistance uh, to assist General Chenault and the Flying Tigers that were off in China. And 
crews from the uh, the Pan Am Africa operation took six DC threes across the, across uh, the southern Asian across southern uh, South Asia and ended up in Dinjan, India, where they operated for about six weeks providing fuel and ammunition across the the hump, supporting General Chenault and the Flying Tigers. Um, it's interesting that we often hear about flying the hump, and it's actually in 1944, 45, as, as the Allied forces are pushing the Japanese back. But in 1942, the Japanese were pushing the British to the west, and they had taken Rangoon, and things were getting very serious for the Flying Tigers, and uh, they needed assistance. So the Pan Am crews, along with some um, Army Air Corps crews and the crews from the uh, um, CNAC, the Chinese National Airline, were flying support missions across the Himalayas into uh, Chongqing supporting uh, General Chanel. So of course the, the Himalayas, um, they're flying. The, the crews are flying DC-3s that had no no uh, window de-icing, no uh, no boots on the uh, on the wings for de-icing, very little oxygen uh, for high altitude operations, and of course no uh, no air support, and they're flying into hostile territory, providing assistance to General Chanel. Now, not all things went well, and here's a picture of an aircraft of a Pan Am C-47 that was damaged during a Japanese air attack in Low Wing, China, in 28 April 1942. So those are civilian pilots flying into China, and their aircraft was damaged in a Japanese air ring. Now, coming back from their delivery missions into China, they were also asked to stop in Burma and ferry out wounded British soldiers. You see here, they're under the, under the, in the shade of the wing of a, of a C-47, and also um, evacuate civilians coming out of Burma. And here you see a, a Pan Am crew in the foreground with uh, their um, uh, evacuees in the background. And so even though we're looking at a Pan Am crew, they're, they're starting to look quite, quite military these days uh, as, as things go on. That's correct, yep. And, uh, but look at those civilians back there. You've got yeah. children, you've got, uh, these are, these are the, the families of Western uh, industry uh, that were located in Rangoon. And they're fleeing, they are fleeing um, the Japanese uh, coming out of, out, of, uh, out of Burma and flying into India for safety. The, uh, the other thing about April of 1942 is rather interesting. Um, a, a, another major event occurs in that region in, 19, in April of 42, and that's the Doolittle Raid. So Jimmy Doolittle and his crews fly into Tokyo, drop bombs, and, and then land or crash land in China. And I often ask myself the question, uh, how did Jimmy Doolittle get from China in April of 42 to Washington in June of 42 to receive the Congressional Medal of Honor? And talking with the Pan Am crews, they said that they had seen Jimmy Doolittle and some of his members, some of his crew members on their flights going across Africa, heading back to the United States. So <clears throat> I've given this presentation quite frequently. And uh, in, in uh, 2016, I was in Missoula, Montana, where I gave a talk at the Museum of Mountain Flying. And uh, this, this elderly fellow came in to, walk to, the, uh, to the presentation. And it uh, turns out he was David Thatcher. And uh, in 2016, David Thatcher was only the second remaining alive Doolittle Raider. And uh, he, uh, we had a chance to chat a little bit and I did ask him, I said, now, David, uh, 
after you uh, came out of China, how did you get back to the United States? And he said, well, we got on these DC-3s piloted by Americans, and we hopped across Central Africa, and we got to West Africa, and we got on a Boeing 314 and flew back to the United States. And uh, it was just really, uh, really extremely uh, significant uh, event for me to meet with David and, and uh, actually meet one of the Raiders and to confirm the story that, that again, they used this, most, this, this active route across West Africa in order to get back to the United States. Now, we talked mostly about uh, providing men and equipment to uh, the war zones, but also the route became very significant, bringing things back to the United States. For example, the Doolittle Raiders came back on these flights, but also things like this, What you see there is rubber or latex, and of course, when the uh, when the Japanese took over Malaysia, they took over the rubber plantation, the Michelin rubber plantations. But in fact, um, Harvey Firestone had actually started some rubber plantations in Liberia, West Africa. So all of a sudden, this this West African rubber became extremely significant and was carried back to the United States by some of these Pan Am aircraft. And uh, talking to some of the crews, they said it was really tough duty uh, flying the rubber or latex back because the smell was so bad in the DC-3s with the, the heat and the rubber smell. Um, it, was, uh, it was quite oppressive. Another opportunity was captured German equipment. And uh, here's a copy of a uh, German 88 millimeter anti-tank gun that was uh, recovered in the Western desert outside of Cairo. It was disassembled and brought back to the United States where it went to the Aberdeen Proving Grounds in Maryland. And it, it also came on one of the Pan Am aircraft. And here's a, uh, a version of this that's in a museum in, uh, in Virginia to this day. Now, operating in West Africa, I mentioned the lagoons. Um, Pan Am also used the lagoons to transport people back and forth. But, uh, you know, the, uh, the FBO or the, the fixed base operators in, in West Africa were a little bit different. And uh, here's, uh, here's a little example of, of what the, uh, the crews found when they came back. Pan Am had two uh, Grumman and Goose aircraft and you see the pilot there and you see the crews getting picked up and uh and using the uh, the shuttle service back to the uh to the land a little bit different uh operation for these uh these crews back in those days they also were involved with rescue operations and i mentioned the uh, the, uh, the the cargo ships that were were needed uh, some of the cargo ships were actually torpedoed off the coast of West Africa by German submarines. And uh, here is an example of a Canadian uh, uh, sea captain who was rescued after his ship was sunk. And he and his crew are, are getting back into the Grumman for a trip back and, uh, and to be rescued from their, from their sinking ship. The uh, supposedly the captain said that uh, he had been uh, he had been uh, torpedoed in World War One, and now he had been torpedoed in World War Two, so that he said that he was going to uh, look for some other type of employment. So again, as the uh, as the war progressed, the uh, West African air route became significant as Lend-Lease airplanes were being sent around the globe to all of our allies. Um, some of the allies were, were British, French, uh, even, uh, even Soviet Union. And here's a, uh, a, a I think it's an A-25 uh, being, being delivered to uh, a, a Soviet airman for delivery to the Soviet Union. 
So the uh, the Pan Am episode um, was extremely important to the war effort as as the United States was getting involved in before the U.S. was actively involved in World War II. The uh, this was a uh, a uh, a poster that Pan Am put out, and again, you see the uh, the clipper up above with the American flag uh, as a as a uh, as a neutral, uh, a non-combatant, and you see the uh, the Pan Am captain here in a uh, almost a, a nautical uh, uniform, which is very very uh, very similar to what uh, what Pan Am was doing in the Pacific as a uh, as a, uh, a maritime uh, capable aircraft uh, delivery and operating system. As I mentioned to you, uh, most of this material came from the, an alumni association that was established uh, of, of the people that worked in, in Pan Am. This is Andy Dawson, uh, who, who worked with me on the book, and, and he had organized the, uh, the uh, veterans, uh, the um, Actually, the uh, the alumni group, and uh, the 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 group met for many years as a uh, as an annual reunion. Um, the uniqueness here is that these are not just all pilots; these are not all navigators. These are these are commissary. These are cook. These are weathermen. Um, just a, a tremendous uh, uh, group of, of gung ho individuals. Who volunteered and, and went to Africa to support the Pan Am operation? Many of them stayed in Pan Am. Some of them um, left the uh, the Pan Am operation and, and went into the military. But again, uh, the, the the uniqueness here is that it was all different types of individuals that participated. Now, the interesting thing that I found was that not very many people know about this this particular episode and that's why they wanted their story told and uh i did look into it a little bit and, and uh you know pan am uh served at a time when when the army u.s army did not have the men and equipment to operate this route well by late 1942 now the u.s is at war uh they've they've the, the draft is in force they now have more men and equipment in the army the army actually took over control of the route in December of 1942, and uh, there lies the uh, the interesting uh, uh, interesting point about this story is that when the war ended, the army wrote the history, and if you look in the army green books, um, the uh, they do mention that the army operated the the African air route. And they actually took it over from a civilian operator, but they did not give credit to Pan Am for establishing it and running it for uh, almost a, a, over a year um, by themselves. So the uh, the Pan Am history here is 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 has not been very well uh, identified, and that's the reason why we did the book. the uh, The alumni group wanted their story told. And so from West Africa all the way to China, up to the Soviet Union, uh, Pan American Airways, Africa Limited, was significant in supplying aircraft to the Allies in Cairo, Moscow, India, and, and uh, supplies to China. So Steve, I think that pretty, here's the, uh, this is our book. Pan Africa across the Sahara, 1941 Pan Am. Um, the book came out uh, uh, in the late 90s, and uh, we're, we've, we've gone into four printing. So um, the uh, the book is available. Um, here's a, a mailing address if anybody's interested. It's it's uh, a thirty dollars for a signed copy of the book, but it's the fourth printing of that book, and uh, I'd be happy to uh, to answer any questions. The book itself. Is over 180 pages. Uh, we have fleet lists in there, engine numbers, uh, an index, and uh, a lot of photographs that are not included in this uh, in this briefing. But uh, it's a real pleasure to, uh, to to bring this to you, folks. And uh, 
I'd be happy to answer any questions. All right. That sounds good, Tom. Right now, we're going to uh, go uh, to our uh, live segment. And uh, again, as Tom said, if you have any questions, type those in the, in the chat uh, box, and uh, we will answer them before we sign off. All right. There we are. And uh, we do have some questions that have that have come in uh, through your presentation, Tom. Uh, I just wanted to mention that you know, as you as you were kind of closing up your your remarks there, uh, you mentioned the fact that there's uh, so much more in the book and there is uh, more than than what we could could do here in, in just under an hour. It really is a, a, a fascinating read. And um, as as you mentioned, I mean, this is a, a pretty compressed time uh, timeline. I mean, it's uh, late 1941 to the end of 1942. And Pan Am stood up this entire air route that didn't exist before. Uh, it was the, really qu quite a feat, and then kind of just lost to the, literally lost to the sands of time uh, in in the uh, in the African desert. It's uh, it's it's an amazing story. Well, it's it's, it's it really is, and, and uh, it has been a real pleasure. Uh, um, first of all, meeting the fellows who were there; that they were really unique individuals. And then to be able to tell their story, and and uh, <clears throat> that's what I promised them was that I would tell their story. And unfortunately, um, they're not around anymore. But uh, it's such a great story that that we're we're still doing that that work. Good. Uh, you mentioned discovering the uh, David Thatcher, meeting him, confirming that the Doolittle Raiders had come back uh, on uh, Pan Am uh, airline. Um, any other like kind of just tidbits of history that just sort of popped up in your, in your research that, that stand out to you? Well, the, the, the whole thing with uh, Wendell Wilkie uh, is something that, that has developed. Uh, I was able to develop that after, mostly after we, we, uh, we did the book. Um, those film clips that you saw, um, we have an extensive uh, uh, list of, of, of eight millimeter motion picture film that the uh, Pan American Airways Historical Foundation uh, helped us uh, uh, upgrade that to HD, whatever whatever the latest uh, 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 filming uh, uh, venture is these days. But uh, just meeting, meeting people, and uh, I've had people call me and uh, say, are, are you the guy that wrote that book? And I go, uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I was. He says, well, you know, let me tell you that, that I was, uh, the, the fellow on the phone said, well, I was there and I've never been able to tell my children about what I did during the war because this was a secret operation and, and these guys took that literally. Yeah. And uh, he said, well, I'd like to order six books for my kids. <laughs> and this, so, you know, it, it, it just, it, it's just really wonderful to be able to, to talk to these guys. And, and I've, I was giving the talk up in Wisconsin, in northern Wisconsin, and, and uh, in November, and uh, you'll appreciate this. But uh, <laughs> the, a, a fellow says, "Well, I was in the Army Corps, Army Corps, and I was in Africa in 1942, but I've, I've I've never been able to tell a story because it was always classified. So now when I go deer hunting, I'm going to tell all my buddies what I did in the war." <laughs> Very good. Well, as I mentioned, we have some some questions that would come in from the audience. Um, were, were the were the Pan Am uh, crews, the ground crews, pilots, did they have any sort of special training going into this, or was it just sort of an adventure? So when when they uh, when the contracts got signed in New York City in, in Washington, uh, Pan Am sent out into the hinterland. Uh, people trying to find pilots and mechanics and weathermen and cooks. And, and they, they, they blanketed the city of New York uh, looking for supplies, uh, plywood and things like that. Um, but they, they, uh, they actually went to um, uh, Army Air Corps pilot training bases. And they were able to, with, 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 with concurrence of uh, Hap Arnold, and the Army Air Corps, uh, they were able to draw newly vintage pilots out of the Army and offer them a civilian job with the promise that when the civilian job ended, they could come back to the Army and not lose uh, long, their longevity um, uh, uh, time and service things. And, and then they went to the uh, 
to the mechanic schools. And, and Andy Dawson is a perfect example. Uh, he was an 18 year old recent graduate of a, of a mechanic school up in upstate New York. And uh, when he graduated, there was a Pan Am guy out there, you know, asking people if they wanted to go and do something exciting, but they couldn't tell him too much about it. And uh, then they gave him a ticket to go to New York City, and they got physicals and passports that had all kinds of, uh, of, of visas in it and things like that. And they, and they still really didn't know where they were going, but uh, but these guys signed up. Uh, in, in mass uh, to, to, to go do something different. Yeah, and, and now you mentioned that the, the pilots, the Army Air Corps pilots became civilian contractors and then were brought back in after the Army took over. Do you know, were there a lot of Pan Am pilots, mechanics, weather people, ground crews or any, did they, did they stay with Pan Am mostly or did they transfer and become, uh, you know, into the Army Air Corps? Yeah. Uh, it's an interesting, it's an interesting uh, uh, sidelight to this whole story. But when the the Pan Amers were in Africa, uh, and as the war, as the U.S. entered the war, there was a big push by the U.S. government to to turn these guys into military uh, people right away, and and not everybody wanted to do that, right. and and it also. Uh, 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 another side of the story is even the uh, the flying tigers, mm -hmm. the guys that were in, in China, uh, they were they were really told that they they should really go into the Army Air Corps, and of course not many of them wanted to do that. So some of the Pan Am people agreed to do it. So the uh, the managers and things like that would become an Army major or an Army lieutenant colonel. And then they would continue to fly or be a maintenance officer or whatever. Um, but but many of the uh, employees came back to the United States and stayed with Pan Am, and then went out into do other things with Pan Am. And Pan Am had other contracts with the government, and and these people stayed. Andy Dawson stayed with Pan Am for 35 years. Yeah. Well, and you mentioned Pan Am having other government contracts. I mean, not only World War. Too, but I know they also had contracts uh, in Vietnam, helping shuttle yeah, yeah. Uh, soldiers back and forth between Southeast Asia and and the states. So it uh, it uh, continued on. Um, is there were there any anecdotes of uh, people the uh, the native population in in West Africa probably had not seen airplanes before, at least not to the same degree as what was happening uh, in their in their communities. What were their reactions to seeing all this influx of not only the aircraft, but the, the people and suddenly, you know, installations popping up where there was nothing before? Yeah. Um, difficult to to fully address that because of, of lack of data. OK, but but more interestingly was the British. The British reaction. So now you, you you have a serious issue within the British hierarchy of all these Americans are coming into our colonial entities and doing things differently and treating the local folks differently than what the British were used to treating them. And uh, I've I've done some research on this and and it it probably would be a a great uh, an, another great story, but. Uh, People like uh, uh, Air Vice Marshal Tedder, who was the head of the, the British, there, there was all kinds of, of I've, I've been to the, to the British archives in, in London, and, and there's all kinds of behind the scenes political discussions about how does the British government control Pan American Airways so that when the war is over, British Airways can, or their Imperial Airways can become the the carrier in Africa again, okay. and, and let's keep Pan Am out. And, and so the, there is a continuous give and take of, about the British attitude, one towards Pan Am itself because of, of the after war air routes across Africa, and then two, uh, how was Pan Am treating the Africans uh, differently 
than the colonials were, were treating them and, and what impact that was going to have. Um, one of the, an, another side to this is that from an African perspective, all of the, uh, the communication across Africa was north-south before World War II. So all the colonial nations in, in Europe had direct links from Europe to their African colonies. So there was no lateral east-west travel across Africa. Now, opening up these air, air routes was really the first time that people could travel east and west across Africa. And, and there's, there's a, a lot to be said about the impact that had after the war was over with. And if you talk about African nationalism uh, in the 1960s, uh, part of that was the ability of the Africans to travel back and forth. When I was in the Ivory Coast, um, I know that uh, the president of the Ivory Coast on his first air flight was flown into Liberia from the Ivory Coast. And so there you had one of the very first times that there was east-west travel with, with, within the African states. Yeah, you had mentioned uh, just briefly about the fact that there were no uh, de-icing boots, very little oxygen uh, on on some of the uh, some of the aircraft, the DC-3s in particular. I know that there sometimes were some modifications made to land vehicles and, and land and ground-based equipment to be able to deal with this, the heat and the sand. Did they do anything at all with the aircraft, or just sort of take them as they were? Yeah, take it as they were, and, and gr grin and bear it. Uh, yeah. They uh, they were really they were really worn out uh, with with the type of missions they were flying, and uh, and the flying that hump was 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 very difficult, and and again just the idea that these were civilians operating in an active war zone, uh, what happens you know if if they run into trouble, and uh, it was it was really a a, a, a traumatic difficult environment. Um, the uh, the living conditions weren't very good, and then they had to they had to drive quite a ways just to get to their airplanes in India, and then fly the long missions, and then turn around and fly the missions again. And it it uh, it was pretty uh, pretty serious uh, endeavors for them. But the uh, you think of in terms of, of headaches and things like that because they they didn't have oxygen, and uh, it it was quite a uh, quite an experience. Yeah. Do you have any statistics on, on losses uh, as far as aircraft or air crews? Yeah, very, very, very few losses. Um, and and in one of the videos, you, you saw a, a burned out aircraft and, and that was a, a that was a takeoff uh, issue out of, out of Khartoum. Um, there is a uh, there was a cemetery in, in uh, Nigeria that there were uh, air crew members buried. But I've, I've not been able to determine whether or not th th any of those were during the Pan Am era or perhaps in the Army Air Corps okay. after, you know, post-1942. And I, and I believe that most of those were in 1942. Uh, there was one episode where, where, where one Pan Am employee was killed and, and they were trying to pump up a strut on a, on a DC-3. And they used, I, I, I'd have to go back and double check whether they used nitrogen instead of oxygen or oxygen instead of nitrogen to, 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 to pump up a strut and it, and it blew out. And, and I believe there was one fatality there. Okay. Um, one of our viewers is asking, and I'm probably not going to get this right, but we'll give it a try. Uh, Fernando de no Noronja airstrip, 700 miles east of Natal. Was that used at all in this effort? 700 miles east of Natal, yeah. Um, okay, so Natal, Natal's in Brazil. Okay. And then the, the, the longer range aircraft could fly across the Atlantic and get to Accra. Okay. And then, um, Ascension Island was built by the Army Air Corps, and that became a stopping point before 
West Africa. So now this 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 name might if that's another name for Ascension Island, I'm not sure. Okay. But Ascension Island became a uh, a unique airstrip. And in my in my uh, research for the book, I was up at the uh, the Army uh, Historical Center up in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, and uh, they uh, one of the archivists there said, "Well, Tom, have you uh, looked at the Mullinex collect collection?" I'm going, no, what's that? <laughs> what's that? And it turns out that uh, that Army Colonel Mullinex was the commander of the air base at Ascension Island. And, and he had kept records of all of the aircraft that came through Ascension Island. And, uh, and I, I was able to look at that and, and just to identify the, the hundreds and hundreds of aircraft that came across the South Atlantic as part of Lend-Lease and the war effort in, the, in 41, 42, and 43. Uh, it's just an amazing number of aircraft. And I'd have to go back and look it all up, but uh, it, was, it was interesting that this guy had kept those records. And then of course, when he passed, his family gave them to the archives and, and, uh, and they're, they're still there. So. Good. Tom, any last thoughts before we wrap up tonight? Oh man, uh, it's just a unique experience to have dealt with these guys. Um, yeah. They uh, they could do anything, you know. <laughs> they they uh, uh, a, a story I like to tell is is uh, one of the reunions was down outside of uh, Tampa, and so we went over to the the, uh, the Kennedy Space Center, and they uh, all these guys were were going into the to the museum there the uh, the, the the facility at the at the Kennedy Space Center, and and they were had to go through a magnetometer and guess what? They all had pocket knives. <laughs> and, and it was like, oh, come on. I mean, these guys, they all have pocket knives. You know, that, that, that's, that's what they do. That's what they do. And so uh, they said, oh, nah, don't worry about it. So th they turned around and they went outside and they took their pocket knives and they pushed them into the dirt next to a tree turned around, went inside, did the tour. Then when they came out, they went and got their knives and picked them up off the dirt. If you, they, they knew how to get around it. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Tom, again, thank you for uh, for joining us. And thank you to, to all of our viewers for uh, joining us this evening. I hope you enjoyed the show as much as, as I did. As always, if you have ideas for a future topic or maybe feedback on um, some of the things we're doing or something you'd like to see us do more of or less of, just send an email to leahblock at media at cafhq.org. I'll, I'll, I'll make one last plug that if, if anybody would like a book, yes. I, I do have books available and I'd be happy to sign a copy for anybody all right we'll uh we'll add a, uh, a link uh to uh, the uh, address in our description of the video so if you didn't catch it when you saw it on screen before uh, it'll be there on the replay again tom thank you much for joining us and we'll uh, we'll see you on down the road we'll see you at eaa sounds good <laughs> thanks again for uh, for being here and for the commemorative air force i'm steve buss have a great night good night